Morning. I hope everybody's doing good this morning. I want to welcome you and thank you so much for joining us today at Community Life Church on this. I'm telling you, it is a stellar Sunday morning. It's absolutely gorgeous. Um, we started this morning off out at Navarre Beach. We baptized 23 people. Isn't that awesome? That was so cool. And we watched the sun come up, and I'm going to tell you, these are some of my favorite days in the world. I, like the memories that I'm always going to hold on to is when I'm driving over the top of Navarre Bridge, and it's pitch black outside, and you can see the beach pavilion and all of the lights from the cars as they're all pulling there, it's as that place comes to life. And I mean, it just does something inside of my heart, knowing that people are there to connect to their faith. And it's just beautiful. So um, at some point today, we're going to roll out some pictures. We're going to put them on Facebook uh, so that we can all experience them together. But just a great start to the day. Thank you all so much for, for being here with us, whether you're in person or whether you're online. Uh, I think God's got some great plans in store for us today. One quick announcement. Um, one of the ministries of this church in this community, Magdalene's, opens up on um, the 1st of October, and so be ready for that. We're excited about all the things that that ministry is going to do and helping to support um, and stop human trafficking. So that's we're just taking a stand against that, and uh, that, that shop or that store sells some of the neatest things. So go by there and see it, and all of the proceeds go to support the ministry. Now, I invite you, if you will, to go ahead and stand, and let's um, join our hearts together in praying the Lord's Prayer. Will you all do that? Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, just for these opportunities to to gather our hearts together. My, my body still has a chill from that gulf water this morning, but Lord, it is a beautiful reminder of, of hearts and lives connected to you. And so God, we just start off this morning by thanking you for your grace and for your mercy. There are all sorts of challenges and difficulties that we walk through in life, but, but it's in days like this where we're reminded that we don't do it alone. God, that you walk with us and you lead us and you guide us. And even in the most difficult of situ situations, Lord, we can experience your presence. And so today, God, we just say that we love you and we stake our claim in you. We love you and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Y'all join in with me this morning and we're going to do amazing grace. My chains are gone. The words will be on the screen. the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. T'was grace, t'was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieve how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed my chains are gone I've been set free my God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns. Unending love, amazing grace. Amen. The Lord has promised, the Lord has promised good to me. His word, my hope secures. He will my shield and portion be as long as a life endures. My chains are gone. I've 
been set free my God, my Savior has ransomed me and like a flood His mercy reigns unending love amazing grace sing it again my chains are gone I've been set free my God, my Savior has ransomed me and like a flood his mercy reigns unending love amazing grace father thank you for this day such a beautiful day lord and we're so honored to be washed in in the water today and and washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. Lord, bless Jim as he delivers our continuing word this morning. Bless this day and bless everyone here, little Lord. We'll ask all this in your name. Amen. You may be seated. Morning, Jim. Morning, Ronnie. How are you today? Good morning, y'all. How are you this morning? Pretty day, for sure. Well, we are going to look at some different things today. Um, you know, we finished what, talking about witnessing last week. I don't know whether you got an opportunity to put into practice some of the things we talked about, but if you ever have, and you did, uh, talk to me about it. I'd really be interested to see uh, what your response was and what people thought. Um, today, though, we're going to start a little bit of something different. We're going to be looking at warfares and battles, um, the battles of life, if you will. And we're going to be on in this for, for a couple, for a few weeks anyway, because this is something we face every day. This, this is our, our, our walk on this earth involves battles and warfare. And all of us, at one time or another, maybe more so now than it was a few years ago, we've asked ourselves, what can we do? What can I do about this widespread and these very serious problems and issues that just seem to surround us that are in the world today. And it's probably going to be not, a, not, a, not going to be a surprise to you to know that the Bible, the Holy Scriptures have an answer to all those concerns that we think about and, and uh, pray about and angst about that's out there in the world. So over the next few weeks, we're going to be really be just stuck in one small portion of Scripture we're going to be looking at the 10th, 10th chapter of the second letter that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. And it begins with an introduction. So Paul is writing this, as I says, to uh, the, his friends in Corinth, people who, who uh, had, uh, had come to knowledge of Christ um, as he uh, worked in that church. So if you've got your Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 10 we're going to look at verses 1 through 4. He writes this, By the humility and gentleness of Christ, I appeal to you, I, Paul, who am timid when face to face with you, but bold toward you when away. I beg you that when I come, I may not have to be as bold as I expect to be towards some people who think that we live by the standards of this world. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. <clears throat> now, we see here the primary theme of this whole 10th chapter, and it shows us that there has been a challenge, you know, a gauntlet thrown down, so to speak, to the authority of the Apostle Paul 
by some of these people who lived in the city of Corinth. And these people were seeking to, to do undermine the effect of Paul's words, both in the letters that he wrote to them and, and his preaching to them while he was there. Now, this should not surprise us today because it still goes on today, just like it did in the days of Paul. Because there are many, many people who strenuously object to what Paul teaches as we see in his letters. They still have a big problem with it. There are certain circles where people maintain that the Apostle Paul actually changed the teachings of Jesus, and therefore Paul really changed the whole outlook and focus of Christianity from a simple, easily understood message to now, because of Paul, they see it as a complicated theological platform that is very, very difficult for men and women to understand. And they see it as completely different in both in intent and in content to that which was preached by Jesus that we find in the four Gospels. Now, something like that had already started in the early church, these challenges. When these Corinthians had received letters from Paul, some of those citizens were really angry about it. They, they did not like them whatsoever. They, they were angered. They, they strongly resisted everything that Paul talked about and said in those letters. They made the claim that his apostleship gave him no more right to speak with authority than anyone else, that he was simply just you know, another guy, He's just another religious figure. And this guy is just really playing the same old games we see from everyone else. You know, power, politics, get to be noticed, look how, look how spiritual I am, listen to me, basically do what I want you to do. And that's, that's the way some people were taking the apostle. In effect, in here, Paul says to these people, Hey, people, this really is not the case. This is not true. Because you Corinthians have really failed to recognize the fundamental change which occurs when someone gives their life to Christ. When a man or a woman becomes a Christian, something fundamental, something very radical changes and occurs in them so that he cannot or she cannot do the things that they once did. And he's saying basically, if you think I act like other people, if you think that my motives and my purposes, my goals are no different than ordinary men and women, then you have fundamentally misunderstood the whole matter. You're way off base. We see in verses 3 and 4, he says, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. <clears throat> this translation NIV translation, utilizes the word world. But we could also substitute words like flesh, culture, or society. Because really what we're doing here, it's really connoting what is basically wrong with human nature. And that is an inherited self-aggrandization, self-centeredness, a self-selfishness, everything about me, and how does it affect me? Basically, what we're talking about, it's, it's, what it was, it's the monkey wrench, in effect, that was thrown in and inserted into the machinery of humanity from the very get-go. And it's the, it's the thing that's responsible for the fact that all of us, all of us begin life not quite right. We begin it with a taint. We begin it with a twist in how we see ourselves and how we see the world. 
When you think about it, we don't have to train or teach a baby or an infant to be selfish. We don't have to train them to do that. Because I will tell you, you don't have to send them to a private school. You don't have to get them tutored to learn how to misbehave or to be naughty. It comes pretty natural to a baby, pretty natural to an infant. If that is the world or what we call the flesh, that tendency to do evil is in every individual. Then if you pull these self-flesh-centered, worldly governed people together into what we would call a society, this is what the Bible calls the world. And Paul is also declaring the fundamental tension that takes place in which you and I live. There's a tension we go through in life as we live day to day. Because he says we live in the flesh. We live in the normal attitude and in activities of society. But he says we don't, we don't fight on those terms. He says we are not. Christians are not carrying on a worldly war. And he's not speaking just for himself and and for the people at Corinth or people in the first century. He's talking about all Christians who have ever lived. You better remember something, that an apostle is a pattern Christian. When you look at an apostle, you're really seeing what all Christians are supposed to be. And he says, first of all, that whether you're of an apostle or not, we live in the world together. We don't run away from the world. You know, you get out your history books, history is just replete. It's full of, of people who have retreated away from the world into quiet places, walled fortresses, call them what you will. And he says, We live in the world. We don't run away from it. As Christians, we are not to run away from it. We're not to create a Christian enclave, if you will, you know, a Christian hothouse, if you will, which which would make an atmosphere which is thoroughly Christian from womb to tomb. We do that, we wouldn't allow curse. We wouldn't allow any invasive ideas or, or uh, secular ideas or forces to, to come and to spoil it for us. We wouldn't want them to have the intent to change us because we want to be as Christian as we possibly can be. So Paul's really saying, and he, we are not to isolate from the world. The Christian is not to be taken out of the world. We are to live in the world. Yet, Paul also says that though we live in the world and we don't run away from society, he says even though that's true, still we, Christians, do not use or utilize human plans, human devices, human methods to win the battles that we face. And it's here that the problems arise. Because a whole lot of people have recognized that the Christians are to live in the world. They have no problems with that. But then they automatically assume that Christians then must think like the world, that we must depend upon the philosophies of men and the ideas of the world for all the solutions. Individual solutions and societal solutions for all the problems we see out there. So Paul is absolutely sure, he's absolutely adamant that we are not to use human plans and methods to win these battles. You know, one of the fundamental errors that's committed by those and well, well-meaning people who are seeking to make make you know, so social concerns, the primary task of the church today is that they are opposing the right enemy, but they're using the wrong weapons. 
They're seeking to employ the weapons of the world, which Paul repudiates. He says, get rid of them. They don't work. They never will work. So what are the worldly weapons? And they're not going to be a surprise to you. They're things like studies, focus groups, political action powers, action blocks, surveys, organized programs, meetings, demonstrations, boycotts, strikes, picketing. I mean, you can think, go back in your mind, you're thinking, all these things, yeah, yeah, I've seen all these things take place as, as we've tried to solve these societal problems. These are the things that would be suggested, think about it, they would be suggested by any non-Christian confronted by the problems of society. Let's get together, let's get our minds together, let's get our experts together, and let's talk about this so we can get it all straightened out. The problem with all that is that is all they have confidence in. And they can't see beyond the material the visible, and the physical. That's all they've got. That's not how a Christian should approach the problems. As the Apostle Paul stated just a little earlier in this, this letter, this second letter, he says, he said this, he says, so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary but what is unseen is eternal. So there's a new dimension, if you will, that needs to come in here and, 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 and make a play here. The Christian approach to any problem, any basic problem, whether that problem is out there in society or, you know, whether that problem is within my own heart, in my own life, It must be different than that of secular society if any battles are to be won. Now, the wonderful thing when you read your Bible, the wonderful thing about Scripture is that as we go do and do life, Scriptures is constantly confirming what the, what's going on. Life is a kind of laboratory that we live in, in which all these scriptural principles that are, that are contained in God's Word, they're being tested over and over again, and they're sort of being worked out from us, either by ourselves or by what we know and what we read about. You know, they're not hard to find. We can find them everywhere. We see them everywhere. We know what is right and what is wrong. The worldly solution or the scriptural solution? What's going to work here? Because history confirms the fact that the weapons of the world do not win battles. Lord knows that's true. Do we still have problems with hunger in the world? Isn't that a societal problem? Aren't we smart enough to solve that? How long have men and women been trying to solve that problem? Yet what do we have? We still have children starving to death. It's because we are using human solutions to a problem that, that Paul says we need to use the weapons of God. The weapons of our warfare as Christians are not carnal. They're not of men. They are not fleshly. They are not worldly. But I'm going to tell you, they're very, very powerful and very mighty. No, they may not be readily evident to you, but they're very, very effective when you put them into practice. So the question we need to ask ourselves is, goodness gracious, what are these weapons? If, if they're not focus groups and education and bringing smart people together and, and talking about it, what are these weapons? When you read this, this chapter, it's, it's pretty you know, interesting to note that Paul really takes it for granted 
that the readers of this letter know exactly what he's talking about. So he, he doesn't even list them, what these, what these weapons are, in this 10th chapter of 2 Corinthians. What we need to do, we need to go and read them into the text which are found in other parts of Scripture. All of us, every last one of us, face problems. All sorts of problems, minor problems, major problems. Normal common problems such as depression or discouragement, lack of funds, just don't have enough money, no resources. Maybe our health isn't what it should be or could be. We have social pressures coming up to us from, from outside. We have, heaven knows we have enough family problems and we've got in-law problems at times. But then we also have things like guilt and greed and shame. And we deal with those things. As a society, we face problems together. I mentioned all those things. The things I just mentioned were all like personal problems. But, but there's also problems in society that we're all facing together. Racial tensions, war, poverty. Pollution, both air and water, inflation, death, taxes, COVID, corrupt leadership, which seems to be everywhere. These are the battles, the societal battles of life. And I'll tell you what, when you sit back and you think, yeah, we've got all that stuff coming at us, it almost can appear to be overwhelming. How are we going to resolve these problems? But the truth is the Christian is not inadequate to deal with any of those things. He or she is the only one who actually is adequate to deal with them because we know that it has not worked for the world for centuries. There are four weapons in the arsenal of a Christian that are to be used as we face these problems both as individuals and as societies. And you might as well get them in your brain because over the next few weeks, you're going to hear these weapons over and over and over again. First weapon is truth. Truth is the very first weapon. Truth is the chief weapon. It is the primary weapon of the Christian. And when we say truth, we don't mean education. Because think about it, think about what's out there, what, how people are trying to solve problems. Education is usually seized upon by those attacking the problems of society as the most effective way of dealing with them, of eliminating them. Well, if we just get people educated about this problem, it's going to go away. Oh, yeah? That very fact indicates that people see that knowledge of reality is a very important thing in solving problems. The only difficulty is that worldly people, and unfortunately many Christians as well, they equate education with knowledge of reality. And secular education is a compound of a couple of things. Truth and lies, intermingled. That's what you find in society. The glory of Christianity is that it introduces truth into any given situation. Truth reveals reality. Truth is reality. Now, when Jesus came to this world, he came to tell it like it is. He wasn't looking to become popular. He wasn't looking at people together and said, well, let's debate this thing. He came to tell it like it is, and a lot of times people didn't like to hear what he had to say. Why? Because he's talked about the truth. He let the people know the truth and the facts about life and about mankind, about what mankind was really like, about what, how God really was, and why we were so separated. He was talking about 
The kingdom of God is not about keeping a bunch of checklists that says, I did this, I did this, I did this. That the kingdom of God is really about faith in who came to save the world. You let people know the facts about life and about mankind. So what Jesus did is he tore away the illusions. He got rid of all the delusions under which men and women labor in the way they live their lives. He ripped off the veils, so to speak. And you can see him exposing the faulty thinking of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes in all four Gospels. You can just see him banging away and getting rid of all of those false, what they thought was truth. Truth is the most powerful weapon. So truth is the stock and trade of a Christian. That is, if he or she accepts the Word of God as the truth, if you accept that as the truth, and you proclaim it, and you demonstrate it as you live your life day to day, those Christians become a very, very powerful and mighty weapon for setting other people free, for solving what's wrong in the world out there. And it's not just truth that you talk about, truth proclaimed, it's truth demonstrated. What are you doing about it? What are you doing in your own life? Because I'll tell you, it becomes a mighty weapon. The weakness of the church, the general church, the church universal, is that it has often been too content to simply proclaim a portion of the truth but it really doesn't give a demonstration of the truth. We talk the game, we don't walk the walk. A Christian, though, above all others, ought to be characterized by two things, openness and honesty. Because this modern world of ours is generously supplied with a ton of what I could call Pitchmen and con artists. There's a lot of them out there. And they are enthusiastically and persistently using the big lie on us. So that makes it both an arresting and a refreshing experience to meet a person or to meet a group of people that are authentic, that are genuine, that are honest and open. Truth, the number one weapon. Second weapon is love. Love. Now, I'll tell you what, that that word is probably the most overworked, overstressed, overused word that you could possibly find in the English language. You know, but we're not talking about the Hollywood slush idea of love or the bleeding heart tolerance of anything that comes along that you just sort of fall in love with. What we're talking about here is biblical love. Biblical love. And that's the kind that requires no return from the individual that is being loved. Doesn't require return. It's love that loves for one reason and one reason over, for Christ's sake. To love biblically is to show total acceptance, courtesy, concern, without partiality, without merit, without regard to background or experience, without regard to color of skin, about anything else that that individual brings to the party. The only thing we concern ourselves with is that he or she is a man or a woman loved by God and a person for whom Jesus Christ died. Your love must go out to them. Not your momentary interest until you gain their adherence to who you are or to your worldview. 
Biblical love is a very, very powerful weapon. And that's the way the early church won their way against a whole bunch of nasty things that were in their path. Councils, governors, kings, emperors, edicts, everything else they had to face. They won it by the demonstration of a warmth, of acceptance that made their meetings when that early church got together, their meetings were such glorious occasions of fellowship. You know what was going on? The whole world hung around, and they were wanting to get in. What is it about these people? What makes them different? I want to be like that. It was the love that they showed. It was the biblical love that they showed for everyone. Truth, love. Weapon three. Righteousness. Righteousness. And fundamentally, what that means, it means obedience to the first two. It means it's obedience to both truth and love. You might call it integrity. It's the refusal, the absolute refusal to yield to expediency. It's to avoid shortcuts. It's highlighted in the fourth chapter of the book, the letter to the Ephesians, where Paul says, we must no longer live as the Gentiles do. And what he's saying is that we cannot go on excusing our weaknesses. Think about that. We have no excuses left in us as Christians. Because if you're concerned about the truth, what the truth says is, is, is that we have right now all that it takes to all that is needed so we cannot continue to go on justifying all our failures. Actually, we have no reason for failure in our lying, our stealing, our cursing, our immorality, our harshness toward others. That all needs to stop. Will will we continue to fall short? Every person falls short. So absolutely, we're going to fall short. But our sinful nature should not be the excuse we turn to when our actions and our attitudes bear witness to our lack of day-to-day righteousness. Now, I know a lot of you are old enough to remember the phrase, the devil made me do it. Some of you are young enough, you would know that. There was a phrase, that, that was popularized, you go back to Rowan and Martin's Laugh-In, a comedian by the name of Flip Wilson. That was his standard line. The devil made me do it. The truth is, the devil doesn't make us do anything. We want to do it. We're geared toward it. That's that tainted part of our humanity that the monkey wrench that was thrown in there at the very beginning. So we cannot go on excusing our weaknesses. Righteousness is never just negative, though, as we must show tenderheartedness, acceptance, and forgiveness for Christ's sake. You know, this is the the warmth of love. When you think about it, if all you can manage to hold up on behalf of your righteousness is that you have this checklist that says, well, I don't drink, smoke, don't gamble, don't go to the movies, I don't go dancing or anything like that. If if that is what you're holding up as your righteousness, I'll tell you, you're a pretty pitiful spectacle of a Christian. If you are a Christian, there must be about your life a quality that cannot cannot be explained at, at all in terms of your personality. In your life, there needs to be a positive glow, a warmth, a radiance, which cannot be explained except God is working on the inside of me. And what you're seeing is not coming out of 
who I am. It's coming out of because of who is living within me. Truth, love, righteousness. Fourth weapon is a compound weapon. And we can call it faith prayer. Faith prayer. And they can, you can sort of put these together, if you will, because when you talk about them, they're almost indistinguishable. Because faith is the reliance, faith is the reliance on the direct activity of God in human life. It's the reliance on activity, that God is doing something. He's going to do something. He's going to work in my life. He's going to change things for me. He's going to do things. All prayer is, it's the request for that to take place. It's the request for God to get involved. Faith is the expectation that God is going to do it. So those things link together very, very well. And if you don't think they are powerful... You might want to read through the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews. Because when you read that chapter, there are a list of achievements of faith in society, in terms of a lot of things, in terms of government and welfare, of the ills of society and battles of every kind. So faith is the expectation that God has not dismissed society nor does he exist remote from it. He is involved. <coughs> He's active. He's moving. He does things. He changes things. God arrests things. God thwarts. God overflows. He builds up. He exalts. And he does all of this in answer and through what we call prayer. So truth Love, righteousness, and faith prayer are the weapons of our warfare, not the world's. They're the weapons of our warfare. They are not carnal. They are not of the flesh. They are not of the world. But they're more powerful and more mighty than anything the world can bring to you. These four weapons have divine power to eliminate strongholds. They're, they're powerful enough to pull down high things that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. They can bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Jesus Christ. And we're going to be talking about that over the next few weeks. Those four weapons work together. In fact, when you read about them, you can hardly isolate one from the other because they're necessary to each other. When the church, when the church begins to bring these weapons to bear, when we get serious about this, that church will once again become a mighty power in society. If the church is not a mighty power in society right now, why don't you check to find out what is the church doing versus the weapons of the world versus the weapons of Jesus Christ? you're going to find out we don't rely on the weapons that God Almighty has given us. But when the church begins to use those weapons, it's going to become, an, it's going to become another power, if you will, the mighty power in society. It's going to be a tremendously potent force for change. And I'll tell you what, the church will then be able to rapidly change outward the circumstances that we find not only in individually, but also in the world. Because we will now have faced reality, and we will be doing reality based upon what really works, which is the truth, the love, the righteousness, and the faith prayer that Jesus Christ has given us. Would you bow your heads with me? Lord, we, we fight many battles in our day. Many of them personal and very, very many of them are cultural and societal. 
We see them all around us, and we're inflicted by them every day. And Lord, we have done our best to solve those problems and address those problems. And Lord, we thank you for what Paul has given us, because he's given us the keys to success. Then when we take truth and love and righteousness and faith prayer, and we use them as you have given them to us, not only are we changing ourselves, we're changing the world. And Lord, we've seen this so often. History is replete with all the things men and women have done to try to solve all of these things using the weapons of the world, and they have all come to failure. But God, you've said that using these weapons that you've given us, they are the ones that will change not only lives, but change the entire world for you. So Lord, open our hearts to this new revelation that we might see how we can utilize these weapons in our day-to-day living. Give us the, the courage, give us the faith, give us the insight to be powerful warriors for Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray this all. Amen. Have a great day today.